welcome to a special meeting of Thursday, August 23rd, 2018. And we're at the Morro Bay Community Center. And this is the uh, Morro Bay Planning Commission. It's a special meeting uh, regarding the uh, plan Morro Bay. We have all the members are, are present here now. And uh, so I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, can we please observe a moment of silence? Okay, thank you very much. Um, please stand, uh, face, face the flag, and I pledge allegiance. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic which stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, there we go. Okay, a little technical difficulties here. So, um... At this point, we'll open the meeting for public comment. We have only one item on our agenda today, so if anybody wishing to address the, the Planning Commission, step forward and state your name. Uh, good evening. I'm Carol Truesdale. I've been in Laurel Bay since 1995, and I say greetings to everyone. It's a beautiful day. And Cindy, I want to go on record to thank you very much for meeting me. I was not able to be at the Planning Commission on August 8th, but you helped me uh, with a map of the overlay, which I feel personally that is not adequate enough to address the ESHA area. And there's a couple of things, um, it's a zone overlay map for the ESHA area, I guess that's what you call it. Um, and I also, on page 190, looking here of your 190 and 370, it talks about the environment sensitive habitat figure C2. Uh, I don't think the ESHA is represented adequately in this area too, especially when it comes to Panorama project that is also a very uh, special area. And another thing too is I changing the buffer zone in the Esh area from 100 to 50 to 25 um, is concerning to me as an environmentalist because you're taking some precious land that was not designed by man but was here when the universe, when the universe was created. And one thing, Scott, that you had mentioned at the meeting, I got home in time to watch the last end when you discussed the, the action the last time. It bothered me when you said, well, it's not a good selling tool when uh, somebody's going to look at property and then there's an ESHA area in there or something about that environmental. And that concerned me because we didn't create it, it was there. Um, and I, I, I'm very concerned, I want environmental justice. You know, that, that's the thing that's really, really important here. That this land was created, we are stewards of this land, and we need to protect it. And it's not for people to build out. And I'm also against this word influence. So thank you for hearing me tonight. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. I'm not going to read it all, so Barbara Dore, Redondo Beach. I guess I've owned property since 1993 and permanent resident for about 12 years. Some of the comments I have, one, I live in the Morrow Heights area, and I'm more carefully reading what, sh what the plan proposes. It cha it's going to change the land use in that area to a moderate density residential, which would allow attached dwellings, which would and could totally change the character of the area. And I, I've watched and participated for about the last 10 years, and it seems that everyone is looking for more compatible, maintaining the character of the area, and not going out of scale with existing development. And on parks, but anyways, I recommend that you change the density to low density residential in the Heights area to protect it. And on parks, I was just appalled when I read the section. We now have 2.97 acres per 1,000 residents, and in our wonderful plan for Morro Bay, we will, for 2040, we will go down to 2.63 
acres per 1,000 residents, and that's truly sad. There's a great demand now. Um, we need more active recreation areas. Our kids play sports, and multi-generational is Graham and Gramp going out and watching somebody play soccer or, or baseball and using the play fields. And another, and that would be, let's see, policy, open space policy, OS 1.1, I recommend it reads five acres as our goal per 1,000 residents and not three acres per 1,000 residents as it currently is. Um, there's another policy in open space, OS 2.3, um, ensure that maintenance, restoration, and improvements made to existing facilities accommodate all levels and varieties of activities. The problem is now there's a great demand. An example would be the pickleball courts at Del Mar. The courts that were there, the users lost um, access when that went to pickleball. We were actually concerned that the Shasta tennis courts might also convert to the currently popular pickleball. And another use where you sacrifice one group for another is right out here. Tonight, there are soccer players out there practicing, and when the original location for the swimming pool, before it went to the high school, was right outside here at the community center, at this community center, would have taken away all those ball fields, baseball, soccer, football. So please work to get that five acres for. And, and also, if you're gonna replace a use, don't replace it. Keep that use, and if you know there's a need for some other use, find another location, which means you will be needing some of those Quimby Act funds to purchase and maintain and repair your sites. And northwest corner of Quintana and South Bay Boulevard, going south where Bay Pines RV is, um, that's really changing. You're putting a commercial use right there at the northwest corner, Quintana and South Bay Boulevard, that's your main entrance from the scenic highway going into our wonderful Morro Bay State Park. People who are coming are in a vacation mood. Hopefully you develop standards or criteria so that that site is developed with a design that's compatible with and complementary to the state park area. So when vacationers come, they feel like they're vacationing, not that they come to a traffic circle with gas stations. They're getting away from the city. Help them do that. Um, also, you're changing the RV park also, that's going to, I believe it's, the corner is district commercial. This is going to visitor serving commercial. Those are wonderful homes for moderate income housing, modular homes up on the hill, and the RV park that's there now serves tourists, but it also serves, serves as a temporary location for, as a location for temporary work, workforce in Morro Bay. I guess you can only stay there six months at a time. But why you would change the use at that corner, I just don't understand it. Um, and along a bit of industrial along Quintana, again, it's a view from Pacific Coast Highway. Very important if you want to draw people into our beautiful community. Don't put the ugly out front. Yet, talking to somebody tonight, they need industrial uses. And I'm almost done if you just. But that's pretty much it. Um, but primarily, Morrow Heights, why are you making it higher density? Why not keep it zoned the way the Cloisters is, a low density residential, so we can keep our single family detached dwellings? Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Uh, please come forward. I'd just like to follow up. My name is Brom, Brom Webb. And uh, what I would like you to do is to please consider advising staff to exercise the park and recreation optional element of the general plan. What I did was I went back and I was reviewing some of the stuff. Pismo Beach has an excellent one. So I don't know. They did their general plan in like 1991 when, when I was looking it up. And they already, I don't know how they got so far ahead of Morro Bay. I mean, if they already had this in their, their general plan some 20 years ago and we're still following up, it's kind of, I mean, for parks and recreation, I mean, this city is basic. That's what this city is, right? So thank you. Okay, thanks. Would anybody else like to speak? This will be for... 
for the uh, for the agendized items and uh, and general comment also. So if you want to speak for public comment here, are we going to have another public comment after the staff report presentation yeah. and yeah. commission the questions and all that? Yeah, we will. And what time do you think that might be? It's, I didn't see it in. it's probably going to be just in a few minutes. We this is the only item. This is the only, events. we only have one item on the agenda. So, so we'll be moving right into our, our presentation here shortly. So maybe by 5 o'clock? Probably by, probably by, uh, probably in about 10 minutes. Oh, great. Okay. So, I mean, it, it might be a, it might be a good idea to take, since we started at 4, take, try to take public comment again at 6 in case folks okay. come around that time frame, because we normally meet at that time, right? I mean. Okay, so let's. Let's have the presentation, the first present part of the presentation, then we'll take public comment, and then we'll, on that, and then we'll, did you? Well, I mean, that's the, that's the item to... on the agenda. If there's general comments, it'd be appropriate for them to speak now. Um, certainly okay. we can, like I said, it might be good to, you know, re, you know, open up public comment again around six to Runs. cover folks that maybe, you know, weren't able to hear or work in or something. Okay. Okay. I believe it 5.20 for a Moral Bay Open Space Alliance meeting. So... Okay. I'd Would like you, to hear the staff report and then and then comment. comment. Well, we're going to have yeah. a we're going to have a running staff. How we're going to be doing it is and how we've done it before. We have a running staff report for as for each I each chapter of of the module. So, but we we're not going to have public comment on each ch each chapter. So, if you have comments prepared, you know, it'd be good to probably bring them up now, or we've got. Uh, We've got the consent calendar, and then we could have public comment then. But that would be after, after the presentation, the first presentation, which would be. How long do you think the first mod, the first? <clears throat> well, so I mean, this is a continued public hearing. Right. Okay. So we're going to jump back in. I'm going to have a couple of slides to show you, but it's you know, but it's we've already opened up this piece of it. You've already started talking about land use. That's what we're. That's where we stopped last time. And that's where we're going to pick back up. Um, I was going to circle back around and go back maybe a step or two to talk about the, um, the land use map because we've had, you know, concern voice at planning commission meetings, city council meetings on the end, okay. and then jump back into where we left off, you know, and you guys would be, the planning commission would be providing comment um, from that portion of the, um, the plan more obey, which is in the you know, beginning pages of the land yeah. use element. Okay, let's... Uh then um, that means we'd probably not have public comments so till after till till maybe uh, maybe five o'clock would be the next public comment. That's good. Time period. <laughs> okay. Great. Okay, good. great. Try it. If, I don't think <laughs> okay. We don't need to make it overly complicated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So then we have uh, we have no presentations. Uh, we have a consent calendar, current advanced planning processing list um, we have a and we have a recommendation to receive and file do we need a motion on that yeah, it's receive and file you don't have okay to do it. Um, then moving on to item number b1 this public hearing this is we're con this is plan moral bay general plan local coastal plan update and this meeting is continued from august 7th 2018 uh, so Yes, as, as was stated, this is a continued public hearing from August 7th, um, and it's related to Plan Morrill Bay, so our, our general plan and local coastal program update. Um, it's from a, from a status update standpoint. Excuse me, Scott. Let me, I'm, I'm sorry. I got, can we, uh, would you like to address a couple of the questions that came forward on the, on the public comment? Oh, I'm going to address the ASHA overlay here in a minute. Okay. Um, there are some changes. Um, proposed to the buffer requirements, um, but those are in relation to, I mean, we've had numerous conversations, ongoing conversations with coastal staff on what we do when the, busher, when the buffer reduces so much, when the buffer doesn't allow for development of a lot, which would be a taking. Um, and so we've worked with them to develop language that would accommodate those scenarios. But in general, our buffer requirements, um, it will still be, you know, at 100, be able to reduce them down to 50, and then further based on justification in a biological report and a finding by the review authority um, that it would remove, um, if you're depending on how far you're reducing it down, um, it, finding that 
couldn't otherwise develop the lot without the reduced buffer. And again, that's to avoid a taking. Um, that's not, the entirety of that is not covered in the general plan and LCP. The implementation where that's gonna be located will be in um, module four. Uh, which is the which includes the overlay districts, um, which incl which one of the, one of which is the environmentally sensitive habitat overlay, okay. and was, which which we mapped on the zoning map. Um, I think um, some of the confusion um, between the land use map for the general plan and LCP, um, and the zoning map um, specifically by um, store um, related to the change in land use. We're not proposing to change the land use in that area. It's remaining the same. Um, I, I think what she's thinking is, oh, but it's R1. R1 is a zoning classification. That'll be on the zoning map. We haven't reviewed that yet. Uh, we're not proposing a change to, to, to her neighborhood, so. Okay, and Morrow Heights is what? Well, yeah, yeah, that remains about. moderate. That's based on the density that's out there now, based on the density of housing. That's why it's okay. that way. We're not so, proposing a change in this document. <laughs> um, land use would remain the same. Um, and I think she was, and then zoning is R1, so. R1 is one lot per house, including accessory moderate. dwelling units. Which is moderate. Okay. Yeah, so, which is moderate, yeah. Okay, just to clarify that there's, we're not having a density change in the Morrow Heights area, so. Yeah. Okay. And so it's attached dwellings. And that, that's currently allowed. Blue that's currently. It doesn't say that. It's currently allowed. Yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's, yeah. The, low, that's low, the current low, zone, uh, zoning. For that area, low density so. is the RA equates to the RA current zoning. Okay. Clusters, then I would suggest you go back and disallow attached. Okay. I don't see it. So, so okay. we're, we're we're dealing with apples and oranges again. <laughs> yeah. Um, land use map, that classification based on the density, moderate density. Moderate density would allow you, if you're you know through zoning, if you were R two or above, to have attached units. Okay. We're not talking about zoning, we're talking about land use, and we're not changing that. Um, the zoning, which is R1, it's gonna be residential single family moving forward. <coughs> we're, gonna get, we're gonna remove the R1 moniker, but it's the same thing and won't allow for attached housing other than for accessory dwelling units, um, which will be allowed in our residential districts, okay? So, so the idea, if you're thinking multifamily housing duplexes, that's not what's gonna be allowed in our single family residential um, areas, as is currently shown in our draft maps. Okay, thanks okay. for that clarification. Okay. Yeah. There's, a, there's a difference between the land use right. categories, that's why it's like that. Okay, so, okay. I, I have one question about the reducing the buffer to 25 uh, feet uh, in order to avoid a decision as to taking. I, I guess I'm assuming that, that the city attorney may have said that if you're precluded from putting a dwelling on a property, that's a taking? The reason, I, the reason I ask the question is because it just strikes me from a practical standpoint, the land is still owned. We're simply saying that there are certain things can't be done. I'll be, most of the profitable things can't be done with it, but you can still do other things with the land. It, it, the idea is removing all economic value from the property. That ends up being the taking. That's the issue we're trying to avoid. Um, we've worked closely with Coastal on this. Um, we have, we've had this issue on a, on a couple of different properties in town, and we said, hey, our current policies don't allow us to do this. So at some point, the city's gonna have to go, yep, that's what the policy says, but the minimum allowable footprint working with Coastal is X. And then Coastal would likely re have to appeal that decision and then go through their finding process to basically say what our what our policies are now being um, revised in a draft format to reflect, and that is, if you, the intent is to stay out of those buffer areas, period. But if you're removing all economic value, then we need to have a mechanism by which we don't do that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I understand that. I guess I'm just, I'm just, without any evidence, I'm just questioning the conclusion that there's not any economic value. I, I mean. Meaning, uh, someone could. This is going to sound silly, but someone could periodically camp on the property, or perhaps they could mm. graze goats, things yeah. like that. No, they wouldn't. Not in a residential zone. No, that's, so if, literally no activity in, in the areas where we're contemplating reducing the buffer zone. Literally no activity could take place there. Okay. You, you know. Okay, go ahead. Can I give you an illustrative example? And I don't know if this is on or not. Um, commercial property on Quintana, adjacent to. Uh, wetlands, which requires currently a 100-foot buffer. Uh, the property itself is about 34 feet wide. 
So com it's about 34 feet wide. 30, okay. So that's an issue where I've, um, there's no application, but I've been consulting with coastal staff on what do I do because our current LCP policy does not allow any buffers at all. It's, it's between 34 and 50 feet wide. Our current buffers don't allow for any reduction if it's identified as wetland habitat. If it's riparian, you can, re can, you can reduce it down to 25 feet, but biological studies say this is not riparian, it is wetlands. And so there is a mechanism for that. It's um, what coastal staff has told us is that um, it's essentially an LCP override, if you will. You're only, re you're, you're only applying enough buffer in order to provide the minimum amount of economic value. So, you know, maybe it's a, a small commercial building versus the, you know, 4,000 square foot building that the owner wanted. It's, it's some type of commercial value. I mean, we couldn't put goat, grazing goats on there. We couldn't make it a campground because it's zoned. Um, I think the zoning on this particular property might be C1 or C2. So we can't do a variance on land use. I mean, that's like a real life example of what do you do when you have a wetland buffer of 100 feet and literally the property's not even 100 feet wide and it's right next to wetland, uh, which is really just channelized drainage. Okay. I Taking a different mindset, first of all, putting no economic value on Esha, that? No, not on Esha, just, just the, the property that's adjacent. Okay, well, yeah. you know, putting, but yeah, but if you're saying it's like, if you're looking at the property as the only thing that is a value that could be developed, that's a developer's perspective. Mm -hmm. However, Esha has a economic value as well. Right. If you know, when, when I look at these buffer zones, if we are going to move forward, because we're, we're looking at the future, right? If we're going to move forward, any development that approaches a ESHA should have a, should be special and have restorative functions to that. In other words, if you're next to a commercial, then it automatically triggers, you have to have gray water, you have to, da, 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 you know, all these things that would have to be, have restorative properties. Because I think that, I think it's a, a, it's a wrong mindset to think that there is no economic development or economic value in environmentally sensitive habitat areas. It's literally a legal question. That's it. Well, or it's. It, 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 yeah, I understand. Yeah. I understand that. Right. Hey, yeah. I don't want development in Esha. I get that. Neither do I. But when faced with that issue, it becomes a legal issue, and there are legal tests that you have to pass in order. So you're not liable for the property. The city doesn't want to be responsible for buying it. Um, so if you don't allow them to develop it, then that creates the problem. And Coastal recognized that because we asked them, "What are we supposed to do with this? We're stuck." Our policies don't allow us to address any development on the lot. So, and we talked with Coastal and they said, okay, yeah, that's right. And then I said, and I asked them, I said, so our current policies don't allow this. This is a problem. How are we supposed to address this in our LCP? And, and, and Kevin Kahn's response was, oh, we've done this in a couple of, in a few other jurisdictions and gave us some examples, you know, of what we should be doing. And that's what we put in our documents. Now, you haven't seen the action of to see the entirety of what that looks like. Um, and you will through module four, which might be at your next meeting, um, if we're lucky. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I mean, there's, there's generalized policy, but it gets implemented through your zoning code, and which is why we have the overlay. I, I understand the concern, and it wasn't us trying to relax any of the standards. It was really us being caught in kind of the catch-22, if you will, um, running into the taking issue. And that's, a, again, a real legal issue, um, and one that, you want you don't want you have a hole in your pot we have a hole in our policy right now that doesn't allow us to address it and we literally would have had to make funky findings and approve of a project to allow them some minimal development potential and coastal would have had to appeal it because it wouldn't have been consistent with the lcp and then coastal would have had to make all these funky findings they do when lcps have these issues in them um and uh and kevin kind of gave us a long explanation about what that looks like and how they do it it was pretty it was pretty interesting i mean i, I Sorry. But Scott, you know, the, the thing is, is when you look at land, okay, land is something you can pick up, you can touch, you can feel. You look at ESHA, like environmentally sensitive habitat, you can do that. Zoning, zoning is, or a little, you should have the overlays should be the development, not the ESHA is the core, is the, is, is what we, as far as the city, value. 
Okay, now a developer maybe not value it because he has a lot, so he values his lot and what he can do. And so I think that that's why there's a lot of, it's a different perspective, okay? With the developer's perspective, I could see that. But from a city, if you want to protect your Hesha, that perspective, I think, requires that we look at Hesha as not only economic, uh, the economic benefits of it, which there's potentials there going forward with what, you know, as, uh, at least what we're doing in California. But, uh, you know, removing that and it kind of um, marginalizes it, okay. I think. Okay, Richard, I, I think we're, you would be, need to be getting into a funding source. We'd need to be getting compensation rates and stuff like that. Funding, so, uh, so I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you right now, funding source, Check out the Strategic Growth Council. They're using cap and trade uh, monies right now to fund millions, millions of, pro I mean, a, a, a lot of projects with millions of dollars. So, as far as an economic benefit, there is a funding source right in the cap and trade market. Okay. Okay. Well, I think that's beyond this module right now. So, I think yeah, that's for. I don't know. Okay, so I mean, we're certainly going to be jumping into Escher later on, so we can have we can continue the conversation when we get there. Um, not a problem. Okay. Um, back to the update. Um, again, looking at potentially having module four, uh, which is the last module of the zoning code, which includes our overlays um, at the at the meeting on at your next planning commission meeting, um, which would be on September fourth, I think. Yes. Um, and then. Uh, this was sort of the, some of the beginning, I think, introduction to the land use element. Um, you know, one of the one of the items that's you know been a sort of a hot topic, um, and I think that it starts on um, language starts on page three twelve of the uh, LCP, and, and if you look at the second to last paragraph, there's a, um, a discussion of the ESHA overlay, and where we were going is we weren't going to have. The um, an ESHA overlay in both the zoning code and the land use map because it was unnecessary. We had policies that were addressing it in the land use map, but it seems to have created a lot of confusion with folks, and so it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't hurt anything for us to have the same overlay in both. There's no we don't have to change change any policies in here for it. Um, it would uh, so it's it's okay if we do it. It actually even references it here in that one paragraph I was talking about. So I think what we're probably going to do is keep the same overlay. It'll be the same exact map, and we'll just put it back on to the land use map. Um, we made a lot of the land use categories the same as the ca categories in our zoning map to kind of provide clarity, so there was less confusion between those two things. Um, Certainly, I don't think you've had an opportunity at this point to review that yet, but you will see that um, moving forward. But I think that's a change that's easy, and I think maybe it'll avoid the issue that everybody's having. Our implementation policy related to ESHA, again, is in the zoning code, um, other than the generalized um, policies that are in the general plan and LCP, and that's all in the, in the green print of this document. Um, there's a whole section that deals with ESHA. Um, so I think we're probably going to use the same one, and the intent there would be over time, and even our policies suggest that, that we'll keep it a live map. Um, we have GIS capabilities now, There's, and we were supposed to do this out of our house LCP, and it wasn't done. Um, and so it'd be good that we can update the map, uh, you know, consistently over time as we identify ESHA areas um, in relation to projects. We can do real-time updates to the map, and then every couple of years send the map off for certification um, to the Coastal Commission to pick those back up on coastal side of things. But we would probably publish the map as a draft um, for the city so that folks that were doing development could see that ESH has expanded into these areas or what, what have you. So it would be a, an informational thing. Uh, because right now we have ESH areas that aren't mapped and we know they're there, but people won't know if they're proposing development. And so they would submit an application currently to us and would sort of be a little bit of an aha. I think, by the way, now you need to go get a biological report done. Um, you know, so you're 30 days into your application with the city. Now you got to go hire a biologist. You're two months out getting the report back, and then we have to develop an environmental document. So basically, we've created, you know, several months worth of delays by not having it out front in our land use documents. So 
Um, this would do that, and it would make the maps consistent. So um, I do propose to make that one change to the, okay. to the maps, and we'll add that overlay back into both. Um, again, it doesn't, have, doesn't change any of the policies in our, in our general plan or LCP, um, but would keep that item on the map. Um, but as an overlay, it's not an overlay in the, I don't even, it's not an overlay in the current land use map. Um, so it'll be an overlay and it'll be consistently shown in the maps moving forward. So we've got, I think we've already talked about the, the table LU1 that talks about the development capacities. It gives you the densities of development that are allowed in um, in our residential areas, you're familiar with seeing that before, because you know, we've talked about that many times, but it also, um, general plan law now requires us to apply that to commercial development, so that's in there as well. Um, we, we, didn't have, we don't have that in the current LCP. Um, we did discuss that at the last meeting as well. Um, these are the land use maps and the categories. So um, to this map, we'd be adding that ash overlay at the bottom underneath an overlay category. Um, I would note that this is the land use map. Um, in the current draft. Um, and this is the land use, updated land use map because we didn't have the Tri-W property shown as part of SOI consistent with the um, purchase agreement uh, for that property. So it's now reflective of that. Um, certainly if that doesn't move forward, then it would be changed. But um, that reflects current actions on part of the city. Okay, Scott, there's a couple of questions. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh -huh. There's a couple of questions on land use map on the land use map that we had from previous um, previous questions that would come forward. For one, the the down in the in industrial or commercial district down in the lower section at the the harbor front um, was was that is this correctly mapped or was that a mistake for? No, it's, it's, it's correctly, Matt. We actually, that's a good point. That was, you're referring to comments that you've heard several different times from uh, Mr. Bill Martin. Uh, we were able to sit down with him, uh, he and his wife, I think, and go over the, the maps and show him. He, his, his thought process when, in looking at the maps, he didn't realize that, um, that the waterfront zoning extended over um, the water side lease sites. He thought it was okay. just on the land. So he's like, why is it extending over water? That's wrong. And so we showed him the map, the current one and the existing and said, no, that's just reflective of how it's done currently. Um, and so he understood that and seemed uh, and seemed okay with that based on our last commentary with him, so last meeting with him. And there was also, um, to, on a previous meeting, we had a question about the bluff top back behind uh, behind Front Street, where it's uh, where it's residential now. There's four or five residential homes there, and it's 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 um, commercial. It's still CBS. It's still CBS. There's no proposal to change that. No proposal to change that. It's okay. supposed to mean you know be maintained as commercial. And so, uh, visitor serving so the existing uses will be non-conforming. They're non-conforming now, and would, would would remain so. Okay. Okay. Um, I I got a, a huge issue with the presumption that we're going to have a public utilities over there on South Bay. Well, well pretty soon. Well, I, I tell you why, okay, and I tell you why there's the thing. We were talking about environmental justice before, and I, I'm going to give you an example of environmental injustice, okay? This, and you know, and being on the on the wharf cap for almost three and a half years, th this presumption that we are going to be able to, or in, first of all, let me preface something. Coastal Commission never forbade, forbade a, de, a development of a wastewater treatment plant west of the highway. They denied, a, they didn't even deny a project. They denied a, uh, it was asked to be denied, but they have never said that there is going to be forbade a, pro, uh, a wastewater treatment plant west of Highway 1. Right where we have the recreational side is where, you know, that little dot right there, that's where the plan is now, okay? Now, environmental justice has more to do with people than it has to do with, as it relates to climate <coughs> adaptation. Because if we're looking at this, the reason why we're going over here is for climate adaptation, theoretically sea level rise. Well, climate adaptation, as it relates to uh, environmental justice, this project 
basically, there's been so many um, misguided and mis um, uh, data that has been manipulated that it's not correct. For instance, the wastewater treatment plant or the wastewater uh, lift station that's proposed there, okay, the energy uses to get the to get to get the uh, uh, sewage there, those are grossly underestimated. Okay. Secondly, the uh, um, the fact that um, we are adapting climate, this doing this project to adapt climate change, and that the amount of energy just to just to deal with the uh, energy used to pump the sewage down there. I had brought up that issue a year and a half ago to Black and Beach in a meeting, and they said, we're not there yet, okay? Well, California is, okay? And that amount of energy, just the energy, and the cost has an effect on environmental justice, okay? It's gonna have a cost on peop on, on, for the community. That's why I think that if we are going to update a map, we should be very careful about just having a presumption that we can just go ahead and put it out there as if it's already a done did deal. We're moving forward with the draft land use map that was approved by the city council. We're gonna to continue to do that until the city council tells us to do something else. Planning commission reviewed this forwarded recommendations on the council and council reviewed it and said yes move forward with the draft as it is the only change that we made was related to the sphere of influence to be reflective of the memorandum of purchase that we have with the tri-diverty property owners related to the sphere of influence this reflects language in that purchase agreement if that thing does, if that project does not move forward then we, we, we would be changing this um, I can't speak beyond that that's the direction the city council has taken. And so this board doesn't have the ability to change that until the, you can make a recommendation. If the, at least three of you want to make that change somehow, then you can. But ultimately that decision has already been, at least in the draft format, in the draft land use plan in front of you, has been made by council. You can certainly make recommendations contrary to what's in here now. That's part of what you will be doing when we're done. Um, I guess it's probably where I would end the conversation. I'm not going to speak to the overall work project. It's not the venue for that. Okay. okay. Thanks, Scott. Sure. <clears throat> Hi. <laughs> All right. Well, Amy's here now. Um, we've been uh, largely catching back up to where we left off. Right now, we had uh, some public comments, and uh, we were addressing some of the items that were raised as part of that. And now we were getting ready to pick it back up where we um, where we left off with the with the commentary uh, with the commission last time. Can Can I ask just one quick question, relative to the kind of issue Ms. Dore brought up? Anything that's a modification of the existing zoning uh, identification on our maps now versus the one that we're proposing? Or, or is there notification of that besides just the map changing inside here? Are, are owners of those properties that are coming under a new envelope being advised that the zoning is changing? We would, we've not land? sent out notifications um, along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, largely, the changes, I mean, our, the city's mostly built out, right? <laughs> so we're not making wholesale changes. Um, the changes that we've made is to add some overlays to allow and in, in, in specifically indicate that mixed use is allowed in certain areas, you know, and that was to, you know, provide some more housing. I mean, we've had this conversation several times. Um, those, yeah. are the, those, are the, those are the, you know, the kind of larger changes that we made are really, they add flexibility to it. We haven't been proposing to change many major land use changes to, the, to, the, to what we have because we're largely built out and that's sort of representative of who we are. If we were trying to change things, we'd be trying to say that's not who we want to be in those locations. And, and so. some of these initiations for zoning changes were because the city owns the property and wanted to have them changed, or the owner advocated a change. Like I remember the one mobile home park, we talked to the owner at the end of 41. He advocated making the change due to the nature of the changes he was doing to the park. Mm -hmm. So I guess my biggest concern is the surprise of something changing in someone's neighborhood, um, it has to be clear from this which parcels 
are being modified. Is there a, a way to see that easily? I, I mean, know we talked about the problems with talking about what text changed within the zone, but within the map. I mean, yeah, you have to compare the maps to look at them. You know, we, we, we've changed some of the names of things. Mm -hmm. um, but we have the tables in here that tell you what the densities are. You can look at the densities on the previous map and see that we're not proposing changes to those. The areas where the changes, and we have, and we, and we have made some slight tweaks in, um, we've had some split parcels that are split zoned and then have land use on them that is one use. And so we've made, we've tried to change those to reflect the use that was on there when they were split where we could. We still have some parcels that have split land use and split zoning where we couldn't make those, um, those changes. Um, those are a handful, really. We don't have a whole, we don't have a whole bunch of them, we have just a few. Um, and then again, the areas where we put in the, um, the mixed use uh, overlays, um, those areas uh, would be where you have expanded capabilities. It's not to say that you can't do them now. It's just that the ordinance wasn't as explicit. This right now we're saying, hey, you're in one of these areas, so you know you have some additional capabilities. Um, to do that, so um, that's and, the change that we've made. And I, and I would add too, um, we've had a couple of situations where the current use was non-conforming. We're changing the zoning to make it conforming. Um, there's an example of an affordable housing project um, on Main Street, people self-help housing. It's currently zoned visitor serving commercial. Uh, that's definitely something we want to keep. It's, uh, it's affordable family housing, so we're changing the zoning so that it, it will be conforming and, it, and they could always add on in the future, whereas right now they can't. That's a great example. Mm -hmm. I guess I just keep going back to the, you know, Commissioner Sadowski was talking about the existing treatment plan. My, my concern is the opposite, is that we've got to show now as, as park space. And if we were losing, we're losing an income stream that then helps us alleviate issues somewhere else in the city. And, and that's the, it, at some point down the line, that's able to be changed as an amendment to zoning if we need to. Yeah, you, you certainly that stuff, it, it takes a while to change any of your land. Anything that's part of the land use plan map, map that I was showing, and, or, the, or the zoning map, which is part of the implementation plan for the LCP, you know, that's a, that's a, has to go through planning commission. You have to make recommendations to the city council. The city council has to have, depending on which map it is, one or two meetings, if it's an ordinance or if it's just um, the land use map for the general plan. Land use map for the general plan takes one meeting from, uh, from city council. Um, the zoning map takes two because it's an ordinance. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it has to be sent off to certification to the Coastal Commission. You can see that it's a fairly long process, and so it's, it's not easily, these things aren't easily changeable, but they can be changed, and mm -hmm. if we do need to make changes, we will. Um, and we, will, we can make changes right up into the point where, you know, the documents are finalized or certified um, by Coastal. Um, so finalized by City Council and certified by Coastal. Invariably, when we get done with this process, and you know, if we're lucky, council certifies it, and we send it off for certification. There, even though we've been working hand in hand with Coastal, um, there, there's likely to be some changes. A handful of them that will have to run back through the process. Those changes will come back in front of the planning commission because you're the land use authority for the city, and you'll make recommendations to council to yes, we'd like to make those changes, and then we'll run it back up the flagpole that way um, to pick up whatever changes come out of coastal. Um, we continue again to engage them though on all the stuff that we're doing, and we have a meeting, a uh, phone call, uh, conference call with them next week. In fact, so, so, so Scott, <coughs> on, sorry, I was going to say, so if someone wanted to challenge the rec the the representation of what the the new zoning is on here, the thing to do is to write a letter to the council then? And, and the planning commission, um, yeah. you know, as we continue to review this. I mean, you, when we're done here, we're likely going to have changes that come out of this that you're going to need to see back. We, mm -hmm. we noticed this is a public hearing because if we didn't get a bunch of changes out of it, there's the potential that at the end you could make a recommendation. Um, but it, it, I, I was just kind of just covering my bases to, by doing that. Um, it's, it's likely that, you know, we'll have to go make some changes and, and, and and update the document so that you can see it again, see that we made the changes um, that were requested, and then uh, you then would be making a recommendation and uh, to adoption of a resolution for um, council to approve and certify. So if and when the um, wastewater treatment plant, you know, gets reassigned or remo uh, moved, would we be doing a specific plan in that area to, to adjust the, change, the 
the zoning? The Correct, and our documents say that the, the policy doc, the policy language in here ta tells, says that for Dynegy, we'll do a, you know a master planning process there. For the wastewater treatment plant, we would do a master planning process there, uh, which is basically like putting together you know its own specific plans, like it's having its own zoning basically for what you're doing there. So you're looking at it holistically. Um, certainly, you know, both sites have challenges, uh, you know, so it's going to be important to have that level of planning, uh, you know, detail provided to any project that would be proposed in those two locations. Okay, so the existing uh, mapping here is basically a placeholder for now. So the ex so we have language in here, we, we, there's language in here that um, the existing wastewater treatment plant, if it were not to go away, would not be inconsistent with the land use changes we're making. It says that. It says it can stay there and not become non-conforming. Say uh, that again. So, so we so because the timing of all of this we I, we don't know I mean certainly we have the 218 protest vote coming up on September 11th um, we don't know how long the process is going to take um, and this could be end up being certified and the plant could continue to operate if we do if it doesn't doesn't if the 218 passed uh, if the protest vote isn't successful and the city moves forward with the plan we're still not going to have a plant out there that's operational for a few years, right? It's going to take a while to build it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to be operating that plant. Well, we're going to go through this process and adopt these documents, hopefully, um, including the maps that have the land use changing. Well, we don't want to make, by doing that, we don't want to make the existing use that's there non-conforming. So it says, yeah, and, the, um, and by doing this, the, the existing land use that's there is not non-conforming. It's OK to have that plant mm -hmm. there. Um, so we have that language in the document so we don't run into that issue um, because like I said, this is all kind of happening at one time, right? Um, so we, we, were, we were cognizant of that and so we have language in there that accommodates it. Okay. okay. Can I, I, have, I have one question. I seem to be inordinately interested in the, uh, what was the former grammar school? And, and so I'm, I'm having difficult, is, is, that, is that designated as, as medium density residential? Is that how, it's, what is, it's high density residential. High, high density. Okay, that's that's what I wanted to ensure. Yeah. Okay. So do we want to pick off, pick up where we left off last yeah. time? Do you want to, you want to pick up? Sure. Hi everyone. Sorry, <laughs> I had jury duty, so I had to be here a little bit late. Um, I believe we were taking comments on the land use element, and we were around the page of the land use map, so we can continue. Okay, so as far as my reckoning is, and as much as I can read the, the numbers, we're at about 3-20. Uh, so does anybody have any issues on? We're into uh, goals and policies, um, LU 1.1 and, and down. Okay, moving on to policy LU 1.8 and um, moving into goal LU-2. Okay, I have a question on um, when we get down to growth management, how does measure F relate to state housing laws that have come down. We've seen that in our housing element when they expected us to add 700 housing units, dwelling units a year. And we have, re we don't have the resources and measure, uh, measure F, you know, limits us to 50 dwelling units a year. So the, you know, the, 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 the projected population doesn't get us to the ultimate cap on that right now. Um, so the projected, uh, the cap is, 12,200 right. um, and this document um, and the growth projections in it don't get us to that number um, so there's not a whole lot we have to do with it we can just recognize the policies that we have um, you know the legislature's been you know throwing out legislation fast and furious requiring you to allow development consistent with your um, with the densities that are allowed and the zoning that's allowed in your general plans and it's projected in your general plans, it's projected in your housing elements, and it's shown in your zoning. 
Um, but the one equivocation there is that coastal cities, you have to get a coastal development permit, so it's not by right. In other cities that are inland, it is by right. Um, we're not subject to that yet. <laughs> um, you know, I, I know there's conversations, you know, about how that might happen, um, but so far they've not been able to sail the Coastal Act and remove that and make it, or haven't chosen to do that. Um, and so we're probably okay, and we're going to be running into, as soon as we're done with this, hopefully, um, we'll be running into the housing element update that we have to do. Um, so we'll be looking at that more holistically and having co and having conversations with ACD, um, State Department of Housing and Community Development, um, about what our policies need to look like, are gonna look like, and they're the ones that are supposed to certify our housing elements and, and that type of thing. And they're having, just got an email from them last week uh, related to the more rigorous reporting requirements um, in relation to the new legislation that's passed and things that they want and how they want us to report in the new forms they're having us weigh in on that. So it's a, it's changing as we speak, uh, how we're going to be dealing with that. It's just the, the picture hasn't really clarified at this point yet for coastal cities. Is, so. is, the, is that discussion of affordable housing, does that, does that eventually get added to this? Where, where, do, we, where do we house that? We, we have affordable housing policies, and we have them in the zoning code, um, and we have them in the housing element. The housing element is part of the general plan, but not part of this effort, because the housing element's on a cycle. Um, and so, uh, and we're due to start that update process uh, for 2019, uh, into, in 2019. Um, and so, that's what we'll be doing. We'll be moving forward with that. We're waiting to get numbers out of our local um, uh, SLOCOG, uh, San Luis Obispo Council of Governments is working on um, development of the regional housing needs assessment numbers, the arena numbers that, uh, that Chair Lure was re referring to. And we've had um, one meeting with all the community development directors in the county um, and, and have a discussion and that was a couple of weeks ago. So we're starting, that kick, we're kicking off that project and they're also looking at the regional transportation plan because part of that lends itself into what our arena numbers are and we had a joint conversation on, on the phone, conference call with HCD about our numbers and they're high, <laughs> what they're asking us to accommodate. Um, and so we've been have, you know, we've sent them a bunch of questions about refining those numbers and how come our numbers are higher than counties that have high, bigger populations and that type of thing, so. But, it, but if, if, a, if a concerned citizen was reading this and assuming that this was all the important stuff that people of Morro Bay should be thinking about, would, would there be a ref, I mean, how, how would, how would an, a typical citizen find out about, besides explicitly asking you what's the affordability policy, that there won't be a reference in this or there will be or? Yeah, the, so the, I mean, once this is adopted, the housing element's part of our general plan. Okay. Um, and so it'll, and it'll remain so. Yeah. Um, it's adopted and certified by HCD, so we're good. Um, and that's existing, it's on our website right now. You can look at it, it's, it won't be, depending on when this all certif certification ends up happening, you know, hopefully we're done with this moving on to other things, but it, you know, it will, when we certify the new housing update, housing element update, then you'll be seeing those things as well as part of the duty of the Planning Commission. Um, you know, and then it'll become part of the overall document, just the new piece will be adopted. It's, that runs on a separate cycle from your general plan update. So, so Scott, if, if we had an edict from the state that came down like, like it did be, before, but imposed a 700 dwelling unit increase per year in growth, would Measure F protect us from that? Would our LCP protect us from that? Or would the state edict override both of those issues? Yeah. So there is a policy in the housing element already that says that affordable housing will be prioritized in terms of the, the numbers that are allowed. So that was something that HCD was happy about if that situation does occur. So just to let you know that. Okay. AECD also doesn't recognize growth limitations, oh. in the, it, 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 as, it, in, as it relates to, as it relates to the, Siri wants to talk to me, um, as it relates to our arena numbers, uh, our regional housing needs assessment numbers, um, we can't take that into account. So um, that's not something that will limit the housing units that we're required to have. I think probably though, even going into the next round, we'll probably be okay based on the. Um, the mixed use component that we have in here that allows for housing units and specifically says that. Before we would have had a problem counting anything like that. Um, we were talking with HCD on the phone about, hey, in our mixed use areas, are we able to count these? They, 
they didn't go as far as committing that they would be, but it, they um, said we're going to have some direction on that about how, how much of that you can count. Because you, you, you don't have to build the housing units right now, um, but you have to have the zoning that would accommodate them. So. They're also open to allowing you to count accessory dwelling units more. You have to do more work in order to show that that could happen. But that is another way that they're open to jurisdictions meeting their numbers going forward. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, kind of following up on, uh, on that, I'm looking at the, the future map there in a the high density residential, and I'm assuming that's right in front of Del Mar Park there. That Yes, uh, correct. Correct, yeah. And when I, when I look at that, um, one of the things that I, you know, like I think uh, Michael said that in a meeting before was talking about high density as it relates to square footage and keeping that small. So if you, is there something that would, in this map, instead of like, you know, when you look at high, and you think of high, a lot of times you think of high density, you think of apartment building or whatever, but uh, having a community where you could have, like, I'm thinking like into the future where you can say, have a community of tiny homes there where you have no cars, you just have EV stations and no, no the, like people that live there don't even have cars. Is that something that we have uh, potential to um, move toward in this kind of plan, or is it something that is just conventional uh, the, the, density? The, the zoning code, so the zoning code is mostly what you're utilizing when you're dealing with development on the ground, mm -hmm. does have, you know, policies in it that, that allow for the um, application of, uh, how do I want to say that? Um, flexibility uh, in our design standards based on project design. Mm -hmm. um, so in, for a site like that, you'd be able to do that. You'd be able to actually put a PD um, designation over it and use our plan development policies because they're the, we're going to those are we're pushing those out. And as it stands right now in the draft ordinance, um, those policies would apply to properties that are over an acre, right? An acre or more, and that's ten, I believe. Okay, so you have tools to, let's say if somebody came in and said, hey, I have an idea for, I'm just going to pull a number, 30 tiny homes with walkways and everything. You have, we have the tools to be able to say, hey, you know, we could take a look at this and have it, it, it does. The plan development um, uh, you know, policy allows us to do that. We're gonna, the, the new zoning code has a real plan development policy in it. Um, you know, that we'll have a plan development, it'll be numbered developments and, and that type of thing. Our, the way we, our plan development policies now are a little bit funky, um, honestly, not typically how you use plan developments. Normally they're, they're related to a development application and you number them over time and you amend your zoning code accordingly, uh, which is what we'll be doing moving forward, assuming that the zoning code gets adopted the way that it's written currently. Okay. Uh, but there's flexibility in there, yes, to, there to, to accommodate, you know, different Com concepts. Yeah, right. and that was, we did that purposefully. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I just really want to go back to the LU2 table very quickly. And, and I may have asked this before, and forgive me if, if we're going back over, but it, it, it doesn't keep me up at night, but it almost does. The, the number of dwelling units that we have shown for 2016, that includes the percentage that we are aware of that are second homes. In other words, when we see a dwelling, we don't care whether it's a second home or it's a primary residence with a person living in it that's got that as their permanent address. We're seeing a structure that we say that's a residence. It does include those, but there is, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have the spreadsheet on my desktop, but the backup math for this does take into, in terms of the increase, takes into account the, the seasonal or the units that are not full-time occupied. I guess because the, the, the worst case scenario, well, my worst case scenario, <laughs> is all those people do retire here and those, whatever it is, 10 or 15% of those houses. It's more like 40. Well, let's, let's say 40. 15. Because <laughs> that'll scare me enough. So that's 10% that's, uh, would be uh, 600 residences. All of a sudden you've got 1,200 people becoming permanent residences just with those. And then if we, 
I, I'm, I, it just strikes me that if we have, if we are able to attract families, then those aren't going to be two people in a home. They might be three or four. And I'm just wondering, are we, are we, are we missing a scenario where we're going to allow, because of our unique generational transition we're going in of, of that wealth of the middle class having second homes choosing to retire here as opposed to the valley? Are we, are we, are we going to off, are we going to miss a trend that's going to put us in a difficult situation. Because I'm assuming the 934 in the commercial is going to really help us with our affordable housing thing. That, that's the, I think we talked about that, that's mostly above the second, that's the second floor downtown and some places right. like we, that. Yeah, we did talk about that So I'm last assuming time. that's going to go a long way to, to helping the affordable piece. But is, is, can, you, can you help me sleep at night about the, the ghost specter of the retirees coming in? Well, like I already said, there is some accounting for the fact that not all the units are occupied mm -hmm. currently, and, and that's been a trend for a while, although it Very has long. changed some in recent years. And then really the increase is mostly based on what the change in the allowed development is. So, and because the trend in growth has been so slow for so long, we didn't really see that there is likely to be everybody moving into those homes <laughs> in some very quick amount of time. I just know I'm the end of the boomers, you know. I'm, I'm and the and so maybe the boomers retiring. will be different. Um, uh, yeah. I'm thinking if I've got a house here, here. So, so, here. So, so again, the, that we're going through, we go through periodic reviews through a cycle, but with the housing element, we would pick that up through that because we identify the number of those units in the housing element. So over time, that's something that gets reviewed and updated more frequently than the general plan. So we would be looking at those things and seeing, oh, we just went from 17% um, unoccupied housing units, you know, or housing units unoccupied to now it's 10. That would be a significant shift, right? I mean, and, and we would be seeing that. We would also be seeing that in, in, in resource use. So um, if it became significant, we'd be seeing it in water usage and, and usage um, of, of sewer and those types of things. Um, so we would, we would pick those types of changes up and we'd be seeing them, and we'd be able to accommodate new policy change direction in through a housing element, likely. And then it would say, hey, you probably need to go update your other policies that aren't consistent with that. I guess the only other question I'd ask relative to this is that residence that we see now that's got a single family home on it, the state has said if you're able, you're by right able to put an accessory dwelling unit on. Mm -hmm. I know we don't see all the things on the list. I know, you know Cindy probably sees gets a better handle, and you probably have a better handle. What's the percentage of accessory dwelling units? It seems like the ones that we see on the Planning Commission frequently have the accessory dwelling unit built in already. The one we saw on Tuesday did. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, are we getting a ghost trend of the accessible dwelling units sneaking up on us as well? That is that accounted for in the growth numbers that we have here? Because that's also an affordable. I'm not worried about meeting the affordable housing. I will not worry about it much. I, I think there's there's a scenario where I can see that happening, but the creep of, of the accessory dwelling units, the creep of the, the second home becomes primary residence, and then the continued growth of, of potentially the spikes because of the, the vacation rentals concern me about our infrastructure. It's not included as primary units, no. So it wouldn't be in the numbers in the total estimated dwelling units. Okay, so let me. But also say, um, I think we talked about having a public comment period at five. Right. Uh, right. Um, I think uh, Ms. Metzger requested. To okay, just to one, speak. one more uh, quick question, then we'll open up for public comment. Um, so, if the population base, say we get a a surge in ADUs and we get a surge in second homes being converted to primary residences, and we, the next census, we hit our 12,000 person max. Would, what's the mechanism for shutting, would we shut down development? Because we would also be, because our housing element requires that we have a certain number of units built, built out. How would that affect uh, new construction and new, new? The way, you know, the, the measure F writes is that we would stop issuing residential building permits. Okay. I'm not going to speak to the legality of that. Yeah. 
you know, I, I, I'm not. I'm not. I mean, I'm not going to go down that road. Um, you know, that would. That's above my pay grade. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, so if we, if, if we start getting close, we have to ha start having those conversations. I mean, we're just not projected at this point to get right. there. To get there, if it started happening faster, though. We're supposed to be looking at these things over time. Like one of the things the city didn't do before is like they just said, "Hey, we adopted this. Here it goes." We tried to update it, sort of, um, and we're not unsuccessful for many reasons. Um, but um, you got to be—you should be paying attention to these things all the time. And if you're doing your reporting on the numbers of these types of things, which is required um, for reporting for our housing element, then you're tracking it. You're seeing the numbers every year, and so. Um, that's how you pick the things up, and then you also pick it up for usage changes. Um, you know, we they they model, looking at they model what's going on, they track the amount of water that we're using, and those types of things. And you would see increases there, and we're like, oh, what do we have? That's what's going on right now, and and you would see that we are, our population is increasing faster than we thought, and we'd have to go back and take a look at what that means. I mean, that's this is a this is a. You know, it's based on information that's a snapshot in time, and then projects it out 20 years. Um, are we always going to be right? I would bet we're not, <laughs> um, but we do the best that we can. You know, these are project a lot of the policies in here are projections, and they're based on growth rates that we have right now and what we've experienced traditionally for for many many years. So, um, but things can change. And and I would also add too that no sooner um, will we finish the general plan update, presumably, you know, in the next <laughs> few months, than 2019 will arrive and we'll be at the tail end of our current housing element cycle, and we'll be having this conversation again. So um, we'll we'll certainly. Uh, It'll, it'll, it'll be a continuing conversation for the next couple of years. Okay, great. At this point, I'll open it up for public comments so that we can, you know, as, as we promised. <laughs> thank you. Good evening, Planning Commission, uh, staff. I want to thank everybody, uh, all the volunteers that worked on this, uh, the Planning Commission, and staff and consultants. I have a few comments, corrections, and questions <clears throat> on the public draft plan, Morrow Bay. Um, I have a correction for the landslide zone map, and uh, that's figure PS-5, and uh, in the local coastal plan, the existing local coastal plan, it shows the Rigetti property. The entire property is a high landslide hazard zone. And in the map in this, it has only a portion of the property as a high landslide um, hazard zone. So I'd like to have that correction made. And. Um, the original geological study for the Rigetti property um, for the original local coastal plan is um, on file at the Cal Poly Kennedy Library in their archives. So I think we need to um, be truthful about that property as far as uh, it is a high landslide hazard zone, the entire property. I have a question. Um, what is the reasoning for the proposed future sphere of influence uh, in North Morro Bay? What is the advantage for the city to um, take the sphere of influence from the county and put it within our sphere? And do you fully understand the unintended consequences of doing this. Pardon me? I think she was asking me a question about who should we respond. I said, we'll respond after Tina's done. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a correction for uh, figures OS-2. S-1 and figure LU-3 and um, I don't see the Cerrito Peak property mentioned as a open space or a park or a public facility 
And can you make those corrections on those maps, please? Um, I have to wonder why the environmentally sensitive area behind Miner's Hardware Store is not designated as an environmentally sensitive habitat area. That's a gorgeous area. And it should be an environmentally sensitive habitat area on our maps. The area of the confluence of Morrow Creek and Little Morrow Creek. Also, if any of you have ever hiked that within there, it's a, it's a beautiful sacred area where the, indig the ind indigenous people had their camps. And um, that should be a environmentally sensitive habitat area on our maps. Again, I'm not clear on the benefit to the citizens of Morro Bay for the proposed sphere of influence to be within the city limits. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else like to speak to this item? Thank you. Um, Carol Truesdale, I've been here since 1995. I want to give you some demographics. I did a feasibility study of the change of our uh, neighborhoods. And do you all realize that 2,800 parcel owners are, live out of our area, which basically is 52.36% of the people that own property here? And we're wondering why there aren't children playing in the streets, why our elementary school does not have the um, uh, registration that they've had in the past. This is changing. You know, we have 250 designated licenses for vacation rentals and 75 in the pipeline. And you're talking about, and I'm one of them because I am a silver tsunami, um, uh, about the additional units as you build when people retire here and put on, what they call the, what were those units again that you call? That Accessory dwelling. Ex yeah, yeah. Excess dwelling, okay. Accessory. <laughs> Whatever, for granny. Whatever it is. Um, so please be aware of these demographics when you're talking about the future of our city. What do we want for us here? Do we want a Laguna Beach? Do we want a Newport Beach? Or do we want the beautiful town that we all kind of fell in love with of Morro Bay? Thank you for hearing me. Okay, thank you. Barbara Dorr. Um, Some time back, I found a statement in the plan that I, I was just really surprised at. And it's also, we should have better page numbering for all of it, it'd be easier for us to write you things and to find things and to talk about things. It's really bad. Sorry, but you've done a wonderful <laughs> job. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Ensure that land use in Morro Bay serve the needs of both local residents and visitors accessing the coast. I think there needs to be a balance towards the residents. More weight on what the residents want. I'm, and I think this language really stood out when I read it some time back, and I did find it tonight. But I'd like to see some kind of balance changed. I mean, I hope all of you feel, first and foremost, the community belongs to the residents. And from most of what I'm reading, it's like the Coastal Commission wrote our land use plan. It, this, many cities will take a stand. And they say, this is our community. Um, we're not doing that. And there's a lot of information in here about lower cost vacation rentals and accommodations, guaranteeing we keep them. Um, VR shall be, shall, be prior shall be prioritized, encouraged, and where feasible, provided. Prohibit loss of lower cost accommodations in coastal communities. Also, 
we have to protect our campgrounds and our RV parks in this community also. And your housing element is done, and you'll be doing a new one. But the general plan has to be internally consistent in a specific element, and it has to be consistent between the elements. And unless I'm wrong, vacation rentals has been a real controversy in this community. And I didn't expect the decisions to be made regarding policy statements of, and commitments on what this city is going to do about vacation rentals at, before we ever had that issue brought back to the city. I've been on vacation in the summer. Maybe I missed something. But I'd certainly like to see a balance towards what the res, how the residents envision their community, not how the Coastal Commission does. Um, and again, the housing element. You're giving away 250 of our housing units. Most of them, if you look online, a lot of small units. These are places where families, young people, could be living and contributing in our community. So we're not all retirees with grandkids on our street. It's, it's really important that you look at those two together. And I hope you don't finish the, our general plan, local coastal plan, without reading the housing element and making sure what you submit if it's 2018, is consistent with the existing housing element. And if it's not, update your housing element. It has to be done every five years, but you can certainly go in and make a change to it early. But it must be consistent with what you approve. Thank you, and thank you all for your hard work and time. I, it's appreciated. Okay, thank you very much. In case, I think that's everybody. So we'll bring it back, close the public, public comment. Scott, do you have any? You want to address some of those issues? Uh, sure. Um, future, uh, the sphere of influence um, item that was raised related to um, North Morro Bay, the area above Panorama. I mean, certainly we've had many, many conversations about this. Um, that area represents the access to the Chevron property and then the two rows of lots um, that sit above Panorama. Um, the discussion that came out of uh, all of the interactions that we've had with the public, uh, public outreach was. Um, and with the General Plan Advisory Committee and Planning Commission, um, we identified, okay, so what can happen there? Because there's lots that are set back there, right? Um, and there's development potential there. And so they can put underneath um, current zoning in the county, they can put on the first row of lots, I think one house and maybe the second row two, under the agricultural zoning that's out there. And in talking with uh, staff at the county, um, they have some, and some one of the concerns that was voiced about development there is that's the backdrop to our city at the north end. And if they could put houses on those lots where we can't, we don't get to say where those houses get located. And so the question became, okay, well, can they locate them? Because there's two ridges back there, one ridge on the first set of lots and one ridge on the second set of lots. And if you were going to build a house out there, probably want to put it on the ridge. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was a concern that was voiced from the public by the GPAC and by the Planning Commission um, that. We don't want to see that. We would rather, you know, those housing units be developed lower on the slopes. Um, we're also pursuing through preservation um, actions with uh, local preservation groups, including Trust for Public Land, Cayucas Land Conservancy, Land Conservancy of San Luis Obispo. We're trying to um, acquire um, some of those lots that are in that location. Um, but putting it in our sphere of influence um, would allow those lots to be annexed into the city in the future, potentially. Um, and we could have the say in where the development on those lots go. And again, under agricultural zoning, they would be able to allow to have one house and we can have them push down the slope adjacent to where our existing um, uh, homes are on Panorama. And so that was the, that's the thought process behind that. It was really for preservation of the views to the backdrop of the city. Um, and that's, and then to the entryway, um, that goes into that lot, there was some, you know, discussion that maybe there could be some sort of economic improvement there, like they could have a campground or something, and that might be something the city could take part in, and that was conversations that we've had as well. And that was pretty much the extent of it. Um, and the good thing is, in, in talking with uh, some of the folks involved with the land preservation ideas out there, um, that second row of lots that are up there, um, it looks like that might be the next, you know, one of the more near-term focuses of the preservation groups. And so we might not have to do anything with those, and we would just be you know, dealing with that first row of lots, which would be great um, you know, if, if that worked out to where we could preserve that backdrop for the city there. So. Okay. And then uh, the Cerritos Peak, did, was that map, how was that mapped on the? We didn't, 
We definitely have already received comments at least once, and we will be adding, I think, what we're for heading towards space. is adding it for the um, open space element. Yeah. And okay. I believe we also decided to make sure that it's referred to as Eagle Rock and Cerrito Peak. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we had that Throughout request. Throughout the document. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had that request. Mm -hmm. And then, lands I'm sorry, lands slide hazard on Rigetti property, is the mapping inconsistent? I have to, where, where, do you know where our existing maps came from? I'm, we're going to have to look into that. Okay. Yeah, yeah okay. I, I wasn't I'm really. not sure why that discrepancy is there. Uh, speaking to Ms. Metzger's question, um, so what about the unintended con consequences of, of that sphere of influence? I mean, I, I don't know what that really would entail. What, what do you th foresee or what could you possibly foresee the unintended consequences be? So, so, so there are lots out there now. Chevron is looking to sell their lots. They've sold several. They've sold several to this point. Um, and you would, right now, you would develop them underneath the LCP in the county, which allows you to build one house on it or, or maybe two, depending on where you're at, um, inside the coastal zone versus outside. Um, if you bring it into the city, we're not proposing to change the land use out there. Stag or Vulture, you could build a house on it. Um, so I don't think there's much change there, other than we would be able to tell the story about where the house could be. And I think the idea is not to have them on the ridge. Um, but if you put it in your sphere of influence and LAFCO agrees, then those properties, you're saying that you're willing to provide services to those properties, and um, they could be annexed into the city. There's, you know, there's a handful of them. There's not a bunch. Right. So specifically, and I'm kind of maybe speaking out of my purview here, maybe Richard can help me out. But so as that applies to um, services, sewer specifically, could that become expensive? They're big enough. They may not need them. It's all. It's all. I mean, it's all part of the review you do when the, when, the, when the annexation comes in. You have to. You have to evaluate all those things. It's a single family house that you can put out there, though. That's the service you're providing. Right. You but I mean, if to. they so hypothetically somebody chooses to want to annex, wants to have us annex, then we would be forced to at that point because we included in our sphere of influence. So no, I don't think so. I don't think we'd be forced to. It'd still be a decision by if, the city. If they choose. It, it, the decision is made at LAFCO. Yeah. Um, usually, depending on, I mean, we're, we're not supposed to change any land use out there, so it would just come, it would likely just come in as agricultural land. Um, and then underneath our land use, that allows you to put a house on it. Right, but as we probably wouldn't allow a septic, we would probably would be required to extend the sewer line, which could be uh, at a I considerable cost. For a single Absolutely. family home. I, I think if I remember the, the plot of those lots, they're significant sizes. The county allows septic systems when you're above a certain height above the water table. It wouldn't surprise me at all that those aren't their own septic fields up there. Right, that but we, we don't have anything to say about it. And I, I think if you want to look at the Tribune article this week that they just talked about what the county had identified as the, the primary places to build, I was terrified to see Morro Bay surrounded by what county staff had identified as the bright green, least impacted way to do it. Now, those are all low-density agricultural sites, which means they're large sites, but they're all green as here's what we think you should, where, where there's the least impacts to develop. And it, it's terrifying. And I don't trust, personally, politically, this council on in the county right now to make any decision about Morro Bay correctly. They have, they have made time after time, I think, the wrong-headed decisions in the county about growth, and I don't trust them around our, our border. So I would strongly suggest we have it in our sphere of influence where we can control it. And it's, and it's also why, um, you know, the planning area extends out several lots into the county. So, and we have an agreement with the county that any, any applications for development that come through their planning department come to us if they're in that area so we can at least have some say on what's in the, on the lots that are surrounding us so we know about it. Uh, and I don't so disagree. I'm just kind of playing devil's advocate here, just yeah. kind of make sure we're, we're addressing Mrs. Metzger's uh, concerns. It's a, I, no, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, I, I think that's important. I, I think that was a great question that was raised at the podium, and I, I think it's a good question to follow up on. I, because what does that mean? If you don't, I mean, annexation, once you're saying you're going to do that, you're saying I'm willing to provide it 
police services and fire services and water service and sewer service. That's what you're, that's what you're saying. What are we getting for that? I mean, it's a trade-off, right? And what we're getting for is the preservation for the backdrop of the city. And we're probably talking, you know, at least that first row of lots, I think there's five of them. Uh, and then there might be another five behind it, so 10 total. It was 15 units was the maximum number that we it? analyzed there for. Are. And pres presumably we would be able to um, allow, hypothetically, worst case, not worst case scenario, that's the wrong term. Hypothetically, those do get annexed in the city. They do develop single family lots. We would allow septic systems. No. no, no. So they would be forced to connect to the sewer main, and there would Correct. be a significant cost Correct. associated with that. Yes. Okay. But that cost would be borne by the developers. Right. Yeah. Correct. Right. right. And to be clear about Cerritos well, Peak, how do you know that? Because I had to pay it. <laughs> so, the, so with respect to Cerritos Peak, okay. land use is open <laughs> space, but the, the zoning is, is low main. density residential. Right now they're both. Low density residential, right? Five. Or okay. moderate, maybe density residential. Oh, yeah, um, but the, the fact is that it's 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 zoned residential. The land the land use. Right. The map that goes with what we're doing today yeah. is is a residential classification. I don't remember which one off the top of my head. Um, and then um, and then the zoning is also uh, residential as well. Oh, but I but I, I thought we were we were going to. I thought there, were, there was a change of foot to make Cerrito Peak as an open space declaration. That's what Amy was referring to. Right. That we would that might be a change that comes out of this discussion. Right, but and, but but I'm, I guess I'm, I'm getting at but there's a possible uh, it might be a possible if if they were to designate that as open space, would the zoning change? Yes, ah. we're doing zoning now too, so it's okay. We can make them consistent. Okay. And, uh, okay. And, uh, so so I mean again so what's I'm just ask the ask the question. Do you want that change for Cerrito Peak to be open space? Yes, I do. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> so, may I, may I, 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 yeah. Okay. So, I then, so we would do the same. We would do the zoning plan to, to, to open space and the land use map to open space. For it's, that it's in the latter part of what we're looking at today, but it is already identified as as kind of an ESHA with some of the species habitat areas. So it, it, it is identified. It's just not pulled into the the front, front discussion at the higher level. Yeah. I think it's already been informally considered not a site for housing for quite some time, but I, that's the question is whether... You know, right, but rather than fighting this again in 10 years, might as well formalize this now while we have the opportunity. Yeah, like I said, all it needs three to nod your head and we can go make the change on the map and then, you know, and then council will get to make the eventual decision on it. But yeah, that's, I mean, it's... That's well, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd, I'd, I'd like there to, to be a, sort of a formal or informal input from maybe the the Morally Open Space Alliance, which is sort of dedicated to trying to preserve that on a permanent basis. But the only reason I'm, I'm bringing it up is because there are there are some sort of optics involved in raising money and optics and whether we're working to preserve a space that might not otherwise be preserved or that that issue. You actually raise a very good question because when we were looking at doing this before, that was the reason why we didn't put it on the maps. So I, I'm not so to, to not because at the time when we were having the discussion, looking at the draft land use maps, they were looking at some grant applications that they might be able to pursue. And if it was already protected or already open space, then they wouldn't be, they wouldn't qualify for the grants. And so that was the discussion that was happening back when we were looking at the draft land use map, which is why we didn't initially put them in there. I, I was actually th thank you for raising the issue. I sort of forgotten about it a little bit. Well, I, 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 yeah, I'm not voicing the opinion that we should mix the idea. I, yeah. I just. I'd like to a little more thought on it. That's all. You know, I was just I was remembering back when you said that I was yeah. like, well, that's actually why we don't have it. It's not looking like that now is because we didn't want to impede their ability to pursue grant funding opportunities at that time. I, I remember meeting with with them and, yeah. and we had that good conversation. I said, okay, well, we're going to be doing this for a year and a half more, so you know we have some time to to wait. So. Okay, back to the back to the plan here. I think we. Went through those issues. So we are, as far as my count is, we're on page 324 with goals and policies. So then, hearing nothing, let's uh, coastal Can, priority uses okay. 325. Yeah, I was going to say I didn't oh. I didn't know if this was the place, and and I I don't have my cross reference notes 
the system very well. <laughs> the the mariculture in the bay. Um, I'm assuming that's something that when we talk about coastal priority uses, because we're talking about coastal dependent uses, we, we do want to advocate for that. I'm, I'm not. I guess I'm not seeing language that's as advocational for that as maybe I thought we were interested in. There's there's some more. Commercial fishing plays a significant uh, economic and cultural role in Morro Bay. Voter approved measure D ensures that areas north of the Embarcadero are specifically designated for commercial fishing infrastructure and facilities to accommodate both, you know, commercial and recreational fishing. So I think that's. I think when we get back into the the uh, implementation. Uh, actions. I think there's. I, I, it's just one of those. It's one of those minor right. things that, as we look at land uses, there that, those accessory it's things that allow us to leverage use of the bay that right. generates so good mm -hmm. good yeah. wages and wow. something local that can come out of. I don't know if we'll ever be able to resurrect the oyster or shellfish industry or things like well, that. Well, the oyster industry is doing pretty well. I, I, yeah. you know, I think we ought to have. We that. do have yeah. aquaculture in the paragraphs that talk about coastal dependent uses, and there was actually another comment that was written in before this meeting that talked about coastal dependent uses in the Coastal Act, and I was going to recommend that we we don't have that definition in the glossary currently, so that we include that, and that could yeah. also specify. But I don't know if you're also looking for more of a specific policy just I, about that. I just think as, as, as people go through, if they're, if they're entrepreneurial and you've got something that triggers a zone that opens up that we would we would want to advocate them being entrepreneurial about using developing industry based on the unique mariculture capabilities. Mariculture is discussed as an allowed use in, in portions of the bay in the um, zoning code. Okay. Sorry. I just think sometimes up front, since this is the frontest piece, even if it's just a sentence somewhere, like I, I tagged it at the base of that coastal dependent use page 25. Yeah, so I guess it's more of a semantics question. Yeah. Do we list out all of the uses there, or do we say coastal dependent uses and then include it in that? So, I mean, so just for perspective, I mean, where most people you look for the allowed uses anywhere in town um, is through zoning, right? You look at the zoning tables and what's allowed there, and you have the list and you know, have all those things. You're like, can I do a restaurant? You're like, restaurant's allowed. Okay, cool. Um, can I do a miracle? So, so it, is, it is in the place where people look, which is in zoning, it's there. I mean, if you do want more, though, you know, we can add it. it just, I just think if, if you look at the harbor, it looks like we're trying to develop boat slips. You know, so you know. Oh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put that out there because it looks like they want to go toward slips or something like that. You know, it, it's just. It's just a. It's just a recognition versus a recall versus recognition. If you see something in writing in front of you, it it keeps you from having to. You know, originate it in your head. That's all. So, we're, Scott, we're also seeing, you know, Measure D North of Beach Street and stuff. References to Measure D. Can we? put a tag to where Measure D is written out specifically and where the where we can reference to Measure D or put Measure D as a, you know, insert Measure D into this. Yeah, I think we, we've discussed this a couple times and right. one idea was to at least include a reference. Okay. You know, going back to coastal dependent uses, you know, we need to... Um, Think forward a little bit more than just what was previous, like oh, a oyster farm. There's opportunities here, like what we have that's unique here is, for instance, eelgrass. There's a pilot, I think, in San Francisco that's, that's they're trying to get um, the quantify the carbon, the greenhouse gas sequestration of eelgrass. So somebody can come up with an innovative uh, eelgrass bank, for instance, in the back bay someplace. These are kind of, these are future thinking, um, even, you know, uh, like a research and development and, and to encourage innovation. 
you know, there, there's a quote. It says people, you know, the, uh, I think Einstein had a quote says, uh, in research and development. He goes, we wouldn't call it research if we knew what we were doing. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so the thing is, is those are the kind of things that we should try to maybe push and encourage. I don't know where that would be, but it's definitely a coastal, it, it, it's a unique uh, area that we have mm -hmm. that we can maybe start being a pilot maybe for uh, so we do have implementation action C12 which is to consider a mitigation a ill grass mitigation bank mm -hmm. okay so and then is there something you'd like added to that yeah and then the other thing that we that maybe somebody like we could consider that we don't have one in the United States right now but these biodiversity biodiversity action plans that they have in you know like in England and in different places and we qualify for those programs because we're a bird migratory uh, area which makes us uh, 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 makes us qualified these are the kind of things that if we can look at it, you know, people talk about ecotourism. Well, the key word is eco, and that's why I keep bringing up this ish and the value of that, you know, the, 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 and, 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 the, and it's going to be getting, quant, you know, uh, quantifying it, you know. So kind of moving, uh, just pushing your thoughts forward that way maybe, you know. Okay. You know, the only other, the other thing I have is recreational boating and infrastructure. Um, I think we do have to have some mention of liveaboard possibilities. It is as RV spaces and, and small homes. There is a vibrant liveaboard culture in, more, in, in California. And I think we need to improve the facilities here for for that. So, okay. So, moving on, moving on. Um, was that a change you to the? Yeah, I would like to see a change to some mention in the recreational boating infrastructure. Any objection? Anybody? Pretty good. What, what, would it, what would it say? I guess. I think I mean, we just we, we, right now it does the policy doesn't recognize it, and we have several liveaboards boards in the, out yeah. there. It, it, it probably is a miss in here um, because it probably should reflect the fact that we have liveaboards. boards. Just, what are we going to say? In our harbor department, you know, uh, you know, administers to them from a lease standpoint. From More from my own ignorance, does, does that require a, a pump out structure for sewage or something like that, like an RV dump station? How do you how do you, how do you do that? There's there's pump outs. Pump outs. So right. the, all the, the we should require they require holding tanks and then pump outs, and so the vessel needs to be able to move to a, to a pump out station and and harbor does regulate those so right but are we saying we want to encourage louisiana houseboats or what are we saying here i mean are we no i think it's just <laughs> probably should just recognize that we have them the, okay because yeah. we're not doing that right the, now okay <laughs> it's a use yeah <laughs> uh, so, uh, that's, why, that's why i was saying by being a miss is like we have those no okay. it's something that we have that's out there that exists in the in the world and we're not talking we're not saying we have that you don't okay. need to maybe well, it's like, say everything but that's one of the things that, yeah one of the issues yeah. is like san francisco only allows 10% liveaboard, you know, for all their slips. And uh, so there's, there's a real issue on that up there and wishing for, for more liveaboard slips to, uh, to handle the community. We'll, we'll touch base with Harbor on that too. I was going to say, acknowledging that they exist is yeah. probably the right thing, but I just, uh, I'm, I mean, do we, are we going to start to enforce zoning codes on the water? I mean, well, um, we have zoning on the yeah. water. Well, I know, but <laughs> answer is yes. Enforcing, you know, I mean, are we going to are we going to actively start seeing houseboats? Um, I mean, that, that, I guess I I, I want to make sure we're not right going down an unintended consequence path. Yeah. There there here, is a limit so. to the number of liveaboard slips to the harbor, so that um, yeah. um, the harbor yeah. masters told me that before. I and. Yeah. We don't, we're not anywhere near at the limit, but um, state lands, I think, puts a limit on that. Um, Coastal Commission's not in favor of additional liveaboards. Yeah, yeah, the there's, a, there's a little bit of nuance that we have to figure yeah. out for that. Yeah. And that was one of the things I didn't remember what the number was. Eric's told me before. But uh, you know, an ideal liveaboard regulation, and we maybe we we need to work with the harbor, you know, to see that, see where that is, and that I think that should be included in our housing element, 
you know, it should require, you know, a yearly trip out around MB1, you know, Morro Bay. Seaworthy. Yes, have seaworthy vessels it's that are. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we do pick up um, liveaboards in our housing element. It's in the current one anyway. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Just, I think, a mention in here just as sure. they do exist in yeah. their, their legal usage. And it, I mean, we'll we'll talk again. We'll talk with Harbor if they, you know, and get a little bit of like a specificity as it relates to what the program is. Yeah. So there's a maybe reference to that. Yeah. Okay. Is that section open to public comment or public comment? Um. Let's see where we are. Yeah. Are you still going to open it up at six? Yeah, we'll open up pub public comment at six. Okay. Sorry. And then. Uh, <laughs> So we'll probably take a few minute break before six and then come back at six and open up public comment. Sounds good. Okay. Okay, so moving through our maps. Um, Which page is it? Do we have? So en energy industrial uses, ag agriculture and aquaculture. Um, so this is still on 3B and kind of lost my page numbers here. Yeah, I had a, I had a question about it's going to show up later too. Um, I'm, I'm just very concerned that we continually see <clears throat> the, the like LU 5.4 and LU 5.5 continually use the creek as a separator um, between the Dynergy site and the wastewater treatment plant site. And I, I think it's a, a big mistake not to look at that whole Route 41 or whatever you call it, Tascadero Road south. The, the North Embarcadero shouldn't end at the creek. I, th I think it ought to look at that whole peace acting and, and some kind of synergy there because I'm really afraid we're going to piecemeal it and it's going to preclude the capacity of, of to, to, to do the best, highest use on the Dynergy site. And, and so I, I, that's just my own opinion is, is that as long as we see them as separate parcels, we're, we're going to have potential loss of uh, some vision on those things. The, the Dynergy site, in some ways, should help us drive the other one in the long term. Yeah, I mean, and we've, we've treated them separately because they're under separate ownership. And I would say right now, you know, the way the, the um, current wastewater treatment plant is scoped, we, we're not moving the um, corp yard out there to save on costs. So. Um, in the, for the foreseeable future, there's going to be that component remaining out there, assuming everything, if everything moves forward and we move the wastewater treatment plant out off to, uh, uh, to the um, Tri-W site, um, you're still going to have that facility there. Um, so we're not going to have as, you know, a whole lot of opportunities to do things because the area where the improvements are for the um, uh, the wastewater treatment plant now, I mean, assuming, I don't even think demo is part of that, so <laughs> the infrastructure is sitting there. Um, so I understand what you're saying, and it probably made a lot more sense before we, you know, really had to start looking at costs to reduce them, and now we're going to have significant infrastructure that remains in that area for the near term anyway. Um, I don't know, but happy to hear some of the other, other the others of you weigh in uh, about what you'd like to see to do there. So. Yeah, I, I agree with Michael on that. I think. The larger portion, the larger section that we can review, the better decisions that can be made for the whole. So, so, so are we? Are, are you really thinking that maybe we can add in? We could keep the policy, keeping the policy separate, and refer to them accounting for each other, meaning right. development capacity that we've identified in here, and so that would force them to look at traffic patterns, right? Because that's probably the big issue. How are we getting in and out of there? I mean, right now, that, that is the biggest issue. Um, it will be once, uh, if redevelopment takes place over there, is how do we how do we deal with that? Um, Find so the zone. That's probably important. So we could do that. Um, to me, it, 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 at some point, I'm trying to find Matt. Go ahead, Richard. Um, I just want to say I, I, I disagree with, with with you, Michael, on that. I think that we uh, we could look at the, that that property, the Dynergy property, as uh, you know. We talked about different ways of egress uh, from from the highway there, maybe making that like a off ramp. However, um, that area there, I think that um, is. Because it's separated by the Creek, and because of you know uh, 
uh, just the way it's located, I think it lends itself to be to be not integrated. I think if you look on the CD1 that we have, the demarcation between North Embarcadero and Cloisters, it, it actually seems kind of ludicrous to me to have the high school in the Cloisters subdivision instead of the North Embarcadero, since. What page are you on? Uh, this is uh, 347, maybe? This is when we start looking yeah. at the community character areas. Because to me, the Cloisters is definitely its own thing. But even when you're in the Cloisters, there's no relationship to the high school because of the screening of the trees. But the high school opens up, on the four, up onto Atascadero Road. And Atascadero Road now has the bike path and everything else that connects to North Embarcadero. So eventually, when we start talking about the rock, and I think you know, to partially go back to Richard's earlier issue, if you look at an Esha like the creek, the Esha isn't a divider, it's a gatherer. It's the thing that actually becomes a feature for the things on Atascadero Road as well as the North Embarcadero. So if you look at it as a boundary where you, you pretend the things on the other side don't count, if I've got a 15-story structure there, which is what the power plant is, something like that, everything I look down on over there has, has an importance as to what I put inside that 15-story building hmm. if I reuse the existing shell. And if I'm looking from that, yeah, the east side has the pg e substation. That's, that's a permanent problem. There's nothing to do there. But the north, when you're looking up th across the dunescape and up, up the coast, is fantastic. And, and so I just think we should be cautious that, um, it, in a way, it, I, I see it as it's, it's part of our front yard. And, and I know people don't want things in their backyard, but that's kind of our front yard. And I, I think we need to be cautious about not losing the advantages of, of that being a really high priority site. It is one of the few properties that were not impacted by lots of um, small parcel holders or things like that. It's totally different than everything else around it. So that, that's just something that comes from having looked at this on the North Embarcadero Futures Task Force a long time ago, that uh, you know the, the same way that it, it has ties to the Embarcadero, but it's its own thing. I think it's got ties up there, too. The, the cloisters with the high school, I think, is a very odd combination. They're not, they're not compatible uses at all. The, the, the high school is an institutional use that has a lot more to do with the public nature of the North Embarcadero than it does the private cloisters area, I think. Personal opinion. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I mean, what are the, I mean, you did. Yeah, they need at least you know two other folks nodding their head in some direction to have us do something. Well, re re returning for a moment just to the subject of the, the Dynergy plant, um, because a any development there is going to generate enormous opinion and be highly politicized, anyone who develops that property um, is, is uh, going to want uh, to garner public, favorable public opinion and they'll be susceptible to incentives. And so joining those two pieces of property, the, uh, the, where the rental property, where the city yard is in the current water reclamation plant in, in discussions, just lends itself to, to creating incentives that would be presented to any developer to say, all right, if you want to do that, you should think about this. And so I, I think mm -hmm. you know, it's only to our advantage to take, care, take a, you know, a more holistic approach to that whole thing. So, so we have, so we have the policies LU 5.4 and 5.5, which are separate for the two sites, and then we have the, um, the figure uh, that Commissioner Lucas was referring to uh, for the neighborhood character areas, um, suggesting that we shouldn't separate the Cloisters area from North Embarcadero in the location that we did that. Yeah. Connected, but not the same thing. Um, so, so we'd like to get input from you specifically for each one of the two policies, LU 5.4 and 5.5, which might actually then lead us into the discussion for the cloisters delineating delineation areas um, between the cloisters area and the North and Barca Dera. Um, so does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? Maybe, okay. 
Yeah. Um, so, so we have the two policies there, and right now they're separate. And I, I thought that's what Commissioner Lucas was referring to: is maybe they shouldn't be entirely separate. Maybe they could be one policy, or maybe we have each policy refer to the other one, mm -hmm. so they're connected. Yeah. Right. Um, so those are the two ways that I see doing it. You could make them one in Part A and Part B. Um, or you could leave them the way they are and just have them refer to one another, um, which is probably the simplest way to do it. Uh, I would just point out that whichever way it goes, well, if there is a change made or a com combination that happens, we would still want to have, a, I think, a separate policy about the continued industrial use. Right. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Thank you. I, I think the, I'm sorry. I think the idea of a Part A and Part D, you know, one, he one heading and a Part A and Part D, so they're, they're combined, but then also can be identified separately. Okay. And I agree with shifting, shifting the, the, the borderline to, to the north end of the high school. I think the high school relates more to, towards, towards that area than it does to the cloisters. I get a little concerned there with the visitor serving mobile home or RV type parks that are in that area and how that those would be affected or if they would be affected if we were to do that shift that area I, 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 don't, I don't think it changes that I mean that's more of a land use function this is more of a this is more of a big picture fun this is really saying hey this is what these areas look like you know I mean we're talking about neighborhood character areas and then we're also talking about the two um, you know master planning processes that would literally take place for the property that contains the current wastewater treatment plant and associated facilities, um, which also has an RV park on it, um, and then the property that contains Dynagy. I mean, it doesn't affect the RV parks in that area other than the one RV park is on the city's property. And we'd have to make a decision moving forward whether that would be something that stays there. It's probably one of the only things you, pro you could leave there because it's in a floodplain and a tsunami inundation zone. Um, you know, if, if we were to get rid of it, that area would likely have be undeveloped and have like park type amenities to it uh, because we couldn't put anything else there. Um, you can have, I mean, if RV park, people can move the RVs out, you know, if there's an issue. So, so you were looking for some. So, so we're looking for the, the, the head nod. And uh, so we have, yeah, we have Chair Lure picking up on saying, hey, like the idea of combining those two policies, maybe in an A and a B, that sort of accommodates, I think, what Commissioner Lucas is, but I don't want to speak for you. Um, and so I have two people sort of in that house. I need somebody else saying that looks like a good idea or other folks saying, eh, not so sure. I'm not so sure. Okay, <laughs> fair. And only because it seems to me, and, and maybe I'm being too uh, nearsighted on this, but it seems like the wastewater treatment plant is going to kind of be dealt with one way or the other in the next 24 months. So, so that's what I was saying. I, you know, I was... Would have, been, would have been much more on board, you know, with the concept, you know, have we been moving all of the, like, if the wastewater treatment plant moves forward to the new project site, um, facilities are going to remain there um, in, in two forms. The old infrastructure for it is not going away right now. Um, and, uh, and the corp yard is going to remain there. And a lift station is going to be built there. And there's going to be a lift station, but there would be a lift station built there, correct? Um, so that stuff is going to stay there, which greatly reduces the things that you can do. Um, anyway, that was just my thought process. Um, I don't know if that changes your mind at all. Uh, it was just, you know, my thought process is, it's, at this point, it's fine combining them or not. I don't know that it makes a huge difference um, because I don't think the likelihood of that site getting redeveloped much I think in the near the term is, is probably low. It's the ambiguity of, of what's going to happen in the very near future that leads me to not want to make a decision one way or the other on this at this moment. So, so the good thing about that, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, might help the rest of you. Uh, so what that looks like is what, the, what that's telling us is, hey, you're going to go do master plans for these things if you're going to redevelop them. If you're not going to redevelop them, then nothing happens. It just says, hey, this, is, this, is a, this, this tells you what's supposed to happen, which is what you want this document to do. You, you want the document to tell you in the future when something comes up, somebody buys Dynagy and says, hey, Going to redevelop it. What am I? You know, what do you guys want to see? You're like, well, this is the process you're going to follow, and it tells you the story here. Um, right? So then I would ask the question: If that happens before the city does a master plan for the other site, then 
is the developer in charge of running the master plan for the whole area? I mean, how would that how would that actually play out? I'm well, not sure. Well, that that was essentially my point. I I think you'd want to suggest to any developer when you're contemplating putting this enormous complex on the Dynergy plant that you may have responsibility to do some mm -hmm. interesting things there, and that will probably be on your ticket. If B doesn't happen before A, then a must be a part of B. Right. See, I mean, at a minimum, like I was saying, we're going to probably, the Dynagy thing is going to have to pick up, like, it's going to look at its existing use. It's going to look like what's around it. Um, and then having these two things together says, oh, hey, what's the possibility related to what's happening over here? And really, the big issue is going to be circulation over there. Um, and so, there's, there's not to say you have to go across the creek. You don't necessarily have to. You, there's other ways you can go on the back side of Dynagy. You wouldn't have to necessarily do anything. Um, but looking at the development of the site on the other side, it would seem that that might be one of the things that comes out of that is you end up with a bridge there. Well, um, I, 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 but I'm, Maybe. you know, we're, li we're, we're living in an environment where, in, in a, get increasingly so, where when we say to a developer, um, what is the public benefit that you're going to present to us? It, it may in fact be more than commercial space, multi-residential and, and the like, we may be looking for I didn't want to suggest what, but there might be something very interesting that comes out of that kind of discussion. Sure. Well, what I'm concerned about is if you, you go up in a, a balloon or something, those sites are inter intertwined by, you know, by the resources in the area. And if you, you know, right now they're artificially divided, I think they need to, need to be looked at cohesively. Sure. Okay. And that's all this is saying is that by combining them, we're recognizing that mm -hmm. that what you do over here grossly affects what you, what you do over here, and it just needs to be looked at and studied at the same time. I'm going to I'm going to agree. I'm going to yeah. agree with that. For the Dynagy site, having to accommodate whatever development would happen on the other side, but I'm not necessarily in agreement with that the other way. So where? Well, I think it was. Yeah, I, I, I think I, it has I, to. You know it. Right. That's, I think that's where I fundamentally disagree. Yeah. I guess is this where I, there could be piecemeal development there, you know, if there's an existing zoning and stuff, and that can be allowed right now. But if somebody comes in with a, you know, that wants to demolish the, you know, the existing wastewater treatment plan and do something really innovative there, then, uh, and, you know, develop the rest of that area in conjunction with the city, I think the Dynergy site needs to be looked at in that instance also. Okay, well, I so, don't agree with that. Okay. I agree with it the other way, but I don't agree with it that way. Okay. So that's just where I'm at. Yeah. Um, maybe, see, for me, when I look at Northern Park, I'm going back to the map on 347 CD1, okay? You got the cloisters and you got Northern Barcadero. Maybe the thing to do is to have, and really, it's not. You know, that area right there where the high school is and flip boats used to be and, and those, that's really not neither North Embarcadero nor the Cloisters. Maybe there should be a band there because we've got a high school, we've got a, uh, we've got a, rec a recreational area, maybe, um, and then we got the, the, the desal plant. Right, and the cor corporate yard at the Disa plant, it's not gonna be going anywhere because one of the things it does, uh, you know, cause it, it does, it's treating the city water right now too. So, um, you know, that's one of the things that I would like to see in, in your in energy industrial uses, maybe expand on that where the desalination plant was constructed and it's, uh, and it's uh, used only to offset seasonal peaks in water demand. Oh, okay, I guess that covered it. But you know, you know, you know the, the, where it's basically using the well water. It's not just the brackish water, but it's the well water is being treated. Okay, but uh, um, regarding those, those, that area, it, it doesn't really fit into neither, so maybe I agree. I, you know, maybe maybe, maybe a Highway 41 corridor yeah, instead of trying to yeah, right there where you have squeeze you up. have a hotel, you have yeah, you know what I mean. Are you, okay, so I'm gonna <laughs> yeah, help us here. <laughs> so it's, it's no, I mean, you guys can talk through it some. I, I I understand. I mean, how you can view them both ways. I, I hear the arguments. So I think I I think I've gotten three head nods, Commissioner Grafia. 
<laughs> putting you on the spot right now. <laughs> on the on the A B concept, you yes. know, kind of been cooling them underneath the underneath one item for the LU 5.5 and 5.4. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do that, you and you'll see that in the update. What? You weren't just falling no. asleep. So so, uh, so we're, we're doing that. So now let's go to the map, um, and and we had, you know concept for moving the boundary of the North Embarcadero to um, the north edge of the high school lot and then closer beyond that. Now we have another idea about a 41 corridor perhaps. Um, well, I, so I, I, again, I don't have a majority. So the, I have the only thing I would say is I don't know where the cloister subdivision technically has rights. Those people pay for certain infrastructure and things like that. And I would base the cloisters on that. Mm -hmm. um, and and then this I, was not based on that. This map right. was not based on that. Right. And what I would say is the high school is very silent on our city. They're, they're very respectful of being silent. The school district has three of the largest properties in town with some of the most exciting things happening next to them, and they're always silent. And I think that's amazing. And, and to me, they're one of the largest landholders in, in, in this, you know, Atascadero Road thing is, to me, it always reinforces it, some of the discussion before about Esha comes into, if I look at Morro Bay, that's dunescape and beach. And all of a sudden, I've got it divided into three different things, as if the beach track beach, the cloisters, and North Embarcadero are going to have three different beach attitudes. They aren't. They're going to be the same thing. We're not going to touch the dunescape. We know it's too, too special. We're not going to touch anything in the water. And so it, it becomes, well, OK, well, what are the connections we have back to the city there? And so that, that creek is that, that beautiful piece that I think in the future is going to be worth its weight in gold as to how that whole area develops there. And the same way the bluff properties overlook the Embarcadero, the North Embarcadero, especially the power plant, overlooks everything that we're going to do on Route 41 at Tascadero Road West. And so, you know, piece by piece, we had beautiful small landholders developed exquisite boutique trailer parks there. <laughs> I mean, I, I can remember that from when Commissioner Lure and I were on before. There's, there's like five or six small, very elite trailer parks there along that road. And, and they've done a beautiful job. So I just don't want to see, you know, that, that get thrown into the cloisters, and I, I do think it's ultimately subservient to what wants to happen at, at the power plant, but I know we have a short-term interest in making sure we keep that 4.5.5 in there in some fashion. The Coastal Commission would not be happy about us having the corporate yard in that zone long-term. It's a long-term problem. We shouldn't have trucks parked next to an Esha next to a beach. At some point, we're going to, so correct, at some point, we're probably going to have to do something there. It's just, it's not going to be part of the pro this project. Yeah. It's going to have no. to be some other, you know, process moving into but the future, right. if the project moves forward. I mean, I don't <laughs> Okay, so his question is, do we want to relocate the boundary of this uh, character? <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, with respect to uh, that second proposal, uh, the, the one about extending the, extending the border and the business of the, the school and all that. You know, that, at this point, I, it, for me, it, it strikes me like that's probably a bridge too far. I mean, I, I simply don't, I don't know enough to know if that's a good idea, what people think about it, reasonable criticisms. Of, well, I, I'm reasonably confident that, the, uh, that in any development plan, the Dynergy, the city yard, and that space occupied by the water plant should be considered in a holistic fashion. That, that I'm pretty certain of, but as to anything beyond it, I, you know, I don't know enough, so I, I, I don't want to pretend I do. This is just included in a planning. We're not talking about changing anything. We're not talking about imposing anything on it. It's just to be, to be included in the planning scope. That's, that's all this is, correct? So, so there's, okay, go ahead. Well, I was just going to give a little background on this. This was something that was created for this plan. It doesn't really exist already in your documents. Mm -hmm. And the idea was really to try to, to capture areas that had similar characteristics. But 
the area you're talking about is so diverse, as we've just been talking about, that that wasn't really possible in that area. So we made a decision about the boundary, and we really haven't received much feedback at all to this point on it. So that's, that's what, how we got where we are today. In the, in the real the meat of it is you have some description of the, t of the areas, mm -hmm. you know, in the text that follows, and then you have the policies. And so I, I guess I would say, you know, if, you, if you're really unclear what it means to move the lines, read the policies through, take a minute, and, uh, and then see what you think, because that's what it really means. Yeah. The, we have a descriptive language. So if you were saying we want to split up the heights, I would probably be responding a lot more to say, yeah. well, actually, you know, there are reasons that that area is designated together. So this area, the a couple other areas, like the Highway 1 commercial, have a lot of different things going on. So yeah. I think your discussion is, is very valid. Okay, but I, the way I see it is that we have, you know, essentially the cloisters development, that's its own entity. And then everything south of there till, till you get to, you know, to the, to the border, you know, the borderline of the, of the Dynergy property, is a diverse mixed group that that I see you need to be able to incorporate each of those diversities and each of that that mixed use into whatever's done in that whole package. So the real you know you got high school you got high school you got vis visitor serving but that visitor serving weaves in and out of that whole area and and the industrial use weaves in and out of that whole area. So you know, like Michael brought up, I think the dividing line is the cloisters. And so that's how I see that whole area. Well, and, and to your point, um, you know, reading through this quickly, so the nature of the residential portion of the cloisters is residential. So, I mean, the high school is more residential than it is industrial, in my opinion. I mean, we're, we're serving. But it's a mixed use kind of thing. It, more closely resembles residential than it, than it does to industrial, to my, in my perspective. So maybe we can disagree on yeah, that, but yeah, uh, yeah. that's, so I would agree with <laughs> Commissioner Lucas on that. If, if we did end up somewhere, it would more be more appropriate in the cloisters than it would be in North of Barcadero, in my opinion. Okay, can we get a decision on this? What do you think, Joe? Uh, I, <clears throat> I, I would, I would uh, not, to, not to change it because Okay. We haven't really solicited public opinion on this. It's, it's a, probably a touchy subject. So no. Richard? Yeah, I, I, uh, I think that we should, uh, I think for right now, leave it like it is. Separate. You have it separated. Because well, we, we, we separate we, the way that it is on the map. We're just, we're yeah, just oh, talking, the map. We're just talking yeah, we're about the map. Okay, you want to talk about the map? We're just talking about the northern boundary of the map. The northern boundary of the northern Barcadero? Yeah, well, I think it's... It, I would favor more pushing that northern boundary by 41, the northern Barcadero boundary, because for the reason being that it's an industrial use and I don't necessarily feel that it's going to go away as an industrial use. It's not going to have to be just uh, visitor accommodation. So with the Dynagy plant, it could be a combination of visitor serving and industrial use. So it would lend itself more toward pushing that, if I'm, proper, if I'm thinking properly, um, uh, the northern boundary of the northern Embarcadero would be pushed over to where the cross section of 41 is right there. So, so is that put the high school in North Embarcadero or put the high school in the cloisters? You know, that's the Cause, yeah. Cause I would it, venture to say if I had to choose between the two, I would put it in Northern Embarcadero okay. more than the cloisters. Okay. Yeah. Okay. After hearing okay. the discussion. So I think we got three for the. Southern boundary of the cloisters, northern boundary of the high school. That's what I'm hearing. Okay. It's okay. I'm not hearing everybody say that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Let's. That's, that's, I mean, that's a, that was a good discussion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll open it up for public comment and then we'll take a short break after that.
Uh, good afternoon, Bill Martini, Morrow Bay. Uh, I kind of missed the boat. I was thinking this was starting at 6 at the vet's hall. I didn't read oh. the whole thing. But no matter what, I, my main comments are going to be, as they've been in the past, is on the south end of Morrow Bay, and it's called Special Planning Area B. And primarily, I'm, uh, right now, I'm talking about the water zoning out in front, and that's in the bay itself. And up until I met with Scott here a few days back, up until then, I always knew that to be zoned harbor, which uh, on your zoning maps, the 1988 map, even on your 2005 map, it showed the bay itself zoned harbor. When I met with Scott, he was saying that the waterfront commercial extended out into the bay. That was a shock to me, because harbor, uh, Waterfront commercial eliminates mariculture, which I've been pro proposing for these lease sites for years. And Scott said that's not allowed in this water zoning. The reason I bring this up is this map was updated in 2010. There's an actually 2005 zoning map that doesn't show the actual bay into a waterfront commercial zoning. So in 2010, Someone or something went awry and all of a sudden the bay, the water in the bay itself, the lease sites out in front of, uh, this is South Main Street, were rezoned waterfront commercial, which would mean you can actually, like on the Embarcadero, we could build a hotel out in the bay or hang in the bay. That was never the intent. Special planning area B actually tells you what is allowed in the bay, and this is on the books right now, and I'll read it to you. It says it's mixed harbor use it sh and shall be for recreational boating and fishing rather than commercial fishing. That's always been the LCP, that's been the coastal plan. Recreational boating and fishing down south of the boat launch, commercial up in Measure D. What's being uh, on the maps right now basically says you can do the kitchen sink down in a uh, residential, primarily a residential neighborhood, and there'd be neighborhood compatibility issues. So what I'm stating is the actual existing map, where I always thought the map was incorrect and it was showing the waterfront commercial as a land and they had kind of included, you know, zipped out in the water lease sites. Now I'm being told, no, the water itself is zoned waterfront commercial in this residential area. I think that's wrong. It was never rezoned waterfront commercial in that area. The, all the previous zoning maps up until this correction in 2010 were harbor. Harbor zoning allows wharfs, docks, boat slips. It allows all that. It just doesn't allow motel, hotels, and the kitchen sink. And so that's, I think, needs to be corrected. And that's my main point. The other thing is there's a, in this area, it only shows the three prime lease sites out in front of the cannery, the fuel dock, and the boat yard. There are other lease sites down there that are not included in this uh, commercial zoning. It doesn't go into the inn at Morro Bay, doesn't show this zoning. In front of the Cove property north of the boat yard doesn't show it. So I, I think it's incorrect and needs to be corrected. And then the other point I'm going to make is Scott also mentioned that the map, the land use map, shows that as a commercial corridor. That's what exists in the residential area along Main Street. It doesn't exist. Scott, we agreed it's incorrect. And I think that needs to be corrected now. All you do is do a felt pen. This is on LU2 to show that area as residential in the R1 zoning as opposed to uh, a commercial corridor. The very last bit of commercial on the waterfront down there, the boat yard is going to be closing. So there is no commercial period anymore. And so if that could be corrected, and then also the water in that area needs to be uh, harbor zoning, which again allows boating, you know, fishing and uh, uh, boat slips and all that. It just doesn't allow motel and hotels and that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, I think we'll close public comment. Let's go ahead and take uh, Take a couple minute break here and we'll come back on this.